civil rights today, um, a couple important reminders. One, you had a paper due last Friday. If you have not turned it in by tonight, it moves from 10%, you know, your 10% late penalty tonight, so you can still write a perfect paper and get that A, right? To tomorrow, it's now 13% off, okay? So get your papers in if you've not turned them in. That's number one. Number two, um, on this Friday, you have an exam in this class, okay? It is an online exam. It will be open from midnight on Friday in the morning until midnight on Friday at night, okay? From 12 o'clock to 11.59. Once you open it, you have a limited time, okay? You have one hour to complete it once you open it. Today after class, I'm gonna send out an email that has all four potential essay questions. Two of them will show up on your exam. Important things about this. If you prepare all four of them, and then you take what you have prepared and you put it into the essay spot, okay, good for you, right? In other words, I'd rather you write a good essay then you scramble, so prepare. You have, you'll have four days to do it. Prepare, write the essays, and then whatever you get, put it out there, okay? You'll also have 35 multiple choice questions. These multiple choice questions will come primarily from Cengage, but a few will come from lectures as well, okay? So the way to study is to do your chapter quizzes with Cengage to review the questions that I have included with all the lectures, and to prepare the essays that I give you today. Okay, you have one hour to do it. Um, if you have extra time, as per ADRC, open up the ADRC exam, not the other exam. Okay? All right, let's talk about civil rights. Huh? Oh yeah, question? I missed a question, yes. Will there still be labs on Friday? Uh, there are still labs on Friday. Uh, you guys are gonna do, well, we have a couple of things. Maybe there's another snowstorm on Wednesday. I mean, you know, who knows, right? If that happens, we'll meet via Zoom on Wednesday. Um, your labs are mainly meant to answer questions about the exam and debrief a little bit about the privilege walk last week. So that's the purpose of this week. Which is not to say you should not attend. You should attend because you lose points if you don't attend. And it will be helpful for you. Okay? So, yes. All right. You guys, when you're answering your favorite Bill of Rights Amendment, 65% said the first, 17% said the fifth, 15% said the fourth, 3% said the eighth. Usually, the Fourth Amendment and the First Amendment are almost tied for first. And this was the same thing in my other class. So I feel that you guys did not get the strength of the Fourth Amendment. First of all, I want to say this. It was stated that the Fourth Amendment only applies to the federal government. That is not true. Why is it not true? Incorporated! Yes, that's exactly right. Did you hear me say incorporated or incorporation? Can you imagine that I'll ask questions about incorporation? You should have, you should imagine that. Okay? So the Fourth Amendment, which says, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects, mean that my cell phone that sits right here cannot be searched by the University of Oklahoma, a state authority, without a warrant to do that. Okay? So remember that. Okay. Let's talk about civil rights. Going back to the first week of class, we talked about founding ideals. Jefferson, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Duh, all men are created equal. Right? Yeah. Denounces slavery as a cruel war against human nature in his original draft of the Declaration of Independence, but did not include it in the final draft. 
James Madison denounces slavery as constitutional convention, the most oppressive dominion ever exercised by man over man. All major foundings of the major figures of founding also denounce. But the Constitution institutionalizes it. Counting slaves as three fifths of a person, prohibiting the banning of slave trade for at least 20 years. So why did they compromise? The thought was, hey, look, these truths of equality and justice for all will be borne out if we have a system of government in place that allows that to happen, right? If we have a democracy in place, if we have free speech, if we have institutions that will allow that to happen. Jefferson, who is much more bloody, frankly, said, eh, there'll be a revolution in 30, 40 years if that doesn't happen. And that's okay because the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It obviously took a lot longer, right? We don't see this until the Civil War. When the South expressly secedes from the United States in order to protect the institution of slavery. They rebel against the United States in order to protect slavery. If you were taught differently in your history classes, then I recommend you read the first paragraph of the Articles of Confederation, where it says, for the purpose of keeping the institution of slavery, to protect it, that's why we're forming. During this period of time, Frederick Douglass is writing in the 1850s. And he says, the natural rights principles of the Declaration of Independence are universally and permanently true. Whether we are abiding by them, believing them, enforcing them, these are universally true principles. Equality, inalienable rights, he says the everlasting glory of America's founding lay in its dedication to those principles and the salvation of the nation lay in its rededication to them. He firmly believed that the United States had the capability to secure justice for all, irrespective of race, color, and this is important, sex or creed. Frederick Douglass, a key part of also the women's suffrage and women's rights movement. He points out there's a history of oppression from what? This is directly from the Declaration of Independence. No right to vote, no representation, no say in laws to which that person submits. Considered property, no right to private property, no right to education. There's a difference between civil liberties and civil rights, which we've already talked about. Civil liberties are those inherent inalienable rights that make us human. Civil rights are the positive acts of government to protect against arbitrary or discriminatory treatment by government or individuals. Civil rights movements, right, are gonna come from the people, actions taken by groups or individuals to urge government action on a civil liberties or discriminatory public policy issue. I am being denied my civil liberties. We as a group are being denied our civil liberties. Or we're being denied equal protection of the laws, the right to vote, the right to swim in the public pool that we all pay for with our taxes. Prior to the Civil War, we know that the abolitionist movement is going to begin at the time of the revolution. South, dependent on cheap slave labor and refusing to give up the institution. And in the North, you have states like Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, who are passing black codes. By 1804, prohibiting free black persons from settling, being seen in public, or voting in those states. In 1808, 
20 years, once they can, right? It's banned for 20 years under the Constitution. Congress is going to ban the slave trade. The abolitionist movement is going to fade because the thought was, if we get rid of the slave trade, slavery will wither and die. But that did not happen. And so in 1820, whenever Missouri applies for admission as a slave state, it's brought to the fore for a couple of reasons. You know, in the North, they say, hey, look, that'll mean there are more slave states in the Union than free states. We don't want that imbalance. But also, people have not been talking about it. When this happens, the Missouri Compromise is put into effect. Line 36 degrees latitude, no slavery to the North. Maine is broken off from Massachusetts and admitted as a free state on its own. It's a balance of Missouri. The abolitionist movement is going to restart, and the women's movement is going to begin. In 1833, we have the American Anti-Slavery um, Society. It's founded by William Lloyd Garrison. You have Susan B. Anthony. You have Elizabeth Cady Stanton. You have Frederick Douglass. All are lecturers <coughs> for this. And what these women who are working two to one, okay, the members of the society, two to one women. They're the backbone of the society, but they discover that Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton is going to travel to lecture, to talk about slavery and the abolition and why it's necessary that she's not allowed to travel by herself. Or women are not allowed to travel alone. Or are not admitted into the halls where they are supposed to be speaking. And so the Seneca Falls Convention and their Declaration of Sentiments in 1848 is going to be an offshoot of this. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <coughs> the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. The grievances are the same. No right to vote, no representation, no say in laws to which she submits. Considered property, no right to private property, no right to education. But here's another one. No right to raise her children. Women did not have any rights when it came to their children. In 1857, we have the case of Dred Scott versus Sanford. Dred Scott was taken into a free territory and sued for his freedom, saying I should be emancipated because I was taken out of a slave state where slavery was illegal. Chief Justice Taney, in a blatant misreading of the Constitution, says persons of color are not and cannot be U.S. citizens. He says, not only that, but Congress can't even legislate these issues. Going to create the precedent that democratic ideals only apply to white men. This is 1857. I want you to think about what it means. What's a precedent again? An example to follow, but specifically in law. It's the legal maxim that is set to be followed by all cases thereafter. Southern states, at the election of Abraham Lincoln, decided that the abolitionist propaganda was going to be overwhelming. 
And so they chose to rebel, to secede from the United States. There are those who were in the U.S. Army, actually most who were from southern states who stayed with the United States. There are notable exceptions. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation. He's going to declare that all slaves within any state were designated part of a state, that's Virginia as opposed to West Virginia, then in rebellion shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. Understand that this is important because he does not free slaves that are still in states that did not rebel. But words matter. This helps the cause of the United States, makes it clear this is a moral issue, and because of that, it helps to win the war. That, and frankly, better military tactics. There are post-Civil War amendments. <laughs> Right? The 13th, which abolishes slavery. South uses black codes to restrict rights. It prohibits black Americans from voting or sitting on juries. 14th Amendment gives equal protection and also grants due process of law, which is how we get incorporation. Due process of law is how we get incorporation, right? of the basic civil liberties that are in the Bill of Rights. The 15th Amendment gives all men, regardless of color or nationality, the right for citizenship and the right to vote. In each one of these, it is also critical that you understand Congress is given the power to enforce it. Women, of course, are still excluded from suffrage voting. And this causes a bit of a schism, schism in the uh, women's rights movement because they've been working together for abolition. They've been working together for the right of women to vote as well. After Reconstruction, we see Southern defiance so that the Congress is going to pass the 1875 Civil Rights Act, but the South is still going to pass Jim Crow laws, and the Supreme Court is going to agree and allow them to keep them in place as they pull all these courts to, cases together in 1883. Again, following a precedent set prior to the 14th, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, when you amend a legal document, you change the contents of what has gone before. The court ignores that in the Civil Rights Cases of 1883. South uses poll taxes, white only primaries, and literacy tests to block black voters. And they can do that, these literacy tests, because you didn't have to be literate if you were white. As long as your grandfather voted, you could vote. Grandfather thought. So, I'm going to give you guys a sample question from a literacy test from the state of Louisiana. Get ready? One wrong answer denotes failure. You have 10 minutes. Draw a line around the number or letter of this sentence. Where are you going to draw your line? Where are you going to draw the line? Okay, around the one, you guys all agree? Wrong. You need to write it, draw it around either number or letter. That's what it says. Oh. oh. Failed. Failed. <laughs> draw a line under the last word in this line. Where are you going to draw your word? Where are you going to draw your line? Under line? Well, the last word is actually word. Cross out the longest word in this line. 
Right? That makes sense. Or if I do cross out word. Or word, because it's a word. I'm clear, right? Either way I do it, I'm wrong. Right? Either way I do it, I'm wrong. Draw a line around the shortest word in this line. So, <laughs> around the shortest word, maybe. Or around A, depending on which. Yeah, how do you draw a line? That's another question. What's drawing a line? I mean, does it have to be, is that a circle? A line is tough anyway, right? Circle the first, first letter of the alphabet in this line. Oh yeah, that first, first gets tricky, right? Are we trying to trick us into circling something in first? Or is that A in the alphabet? In the space below, draw three circles, one inside the other. If I were drawing this, I'd draw it like this. Thanks. But then I have two inside. Right? So that's wrong. But that's how I would have done it. Above the letter X, make a small cross. Uh oh, wait a second. How did you cross out that longest word before? Did you do it like this? Is that what a cross is? Or can you do a cross like this? Or like with a line? Draw a line through the letter below. I think this is the most clear, right? Draw a line through the letter below that comes early to the alphabet. And then this is set below. Where are you going to draw your line through? C, right? I, I have difficulty finding the trick in this one. It might still be there. <laughs> I've, already, I've already lost, anyway. Draw a line through the letter below that comes last in the alphabet. Z. In the space below, write the word noise backwards and place a dot over what would have been its second letter should it have been written forward. So, do I write it like this? Right? Do I write it like this? Or, is that incorrect? Should I have written it backwards completely? Right? Hold on, I don't even know if I can do it. Right? Which one's right? Which one's right? Of the way, let's say we somehow got through all these. Eric, yeah? And I'll say on the Alabama literacy test, they asked the date in which the state of Oklahoma was founded. Date in which the state of Oklahoma yeah, was founded. The date. The date, the actual date. Yeah. Statehood date. What is it? November 17th. November 17th. Good job, guys. But you do this instead. Give me your age and days. Give me your age and days. Don't use that calculator. Give me your age and days. I mean, don't forget leap years. I'm shocked anybody in the state of Louisiana was allowed to vote. Grandfather clauses. Oh, yeah. Grandfather clauses. Right? So let's say you had somebody who was actually relatively fair, and you did this the way that seemed obvious. Good luck. Right? In 1896, Homer Randolph Plessy who considered himself to be white. He said, look, I'm seven-eighths white and one-eighth black. I'm more white than I am black. I'm going to sit the whites only car. He was removed and arrested whenever he refused to sit the colored car. And he sued. He said the 14th Amendment makes racial segregation illegal. Why? What does the 14th Amendment say? Equal protection of the laws. Right? But the Supreme Court rules in Plessy that the Louisiana law was constitutional and that separate but equal facilities for blacks did not violate the Equal Protection Clause. Now, Harlan, Justice Harlan, is a lone dissenter in this. And he says, the ruling today rendered will have an effect like that of the Dred Scott case. 
It's going to lead to bloodshed and revolution. It's incorrect. It's a poor reading of the Constitution. But this just leads to more Jim Crow law. In 1914, every southern state had passed laws that created two separate societies, one black, one white. And I want you to think about that because it doesn't just say you can segregate. It says you have to segregate. So if I own a store, I don't have a choice. I can't say anybody can come in because then I'm breaking the law. Schools, restaurants, hotels, public transportation, theaters, restrooms, and marriage. Loving versus Virginia. Has anybody seen Loving? Good movie, right? It's about specifically this. In 1967, this question of whether we can marry who we love, right? Women's equality. 1990 to 1920, like I said, there's a little bit of a, some dissension. The women's movement has some problems after the passage of the 15th Amendment. But they're going to reform, and suffrage is their central focus, getting women the right to vote. Led by the National American Woman Suffrage Association, that's a conservative group. Carrie Chapman Cap, a bit of a tippler. She would meet with the president, members of Congress, governors, and argue, hey, look, you know, clearly we're having an educated discussion. Right? And by having this, this proves that I am capable of voting. Well, you're capable. Right? But not all women are. At the same time, there's the National Women's Congress. This is Alice Paul and Lucy Burns. Who's William David Thoreau? Henry David Thoreau, sorry. Who's Henry David Thoreau? You guys know. You know who Thoreau is. Tell me who Thoreau is. A poet? Yes. Tell me. Huh? No. But he is an author. Okay. That's J.D. Salinger. Good point. Okay. Henry David Thoreau writes several things, but one of the things he writes is called civil disobedience. Henry David Thoreau refused to pay his taxes in the 1950s because the United States allowed slavery. And so he refused to pay his taxes to the federal government, and what happened to him? Put in jail. He was put in jail. And he refused to pay the fine to get out of jail. Other people usually bailed him out, but he said, I will not pay this. Alice Paul and Lucy Burns used this idea in civil disobedience to peacefully protest unjust laws. The idea that we do not have to obey laws that are unjust. Civil disobedience. So they protested the president. They had sit-ins in places where only men were allowed. And when they were sent to jail for blocking traffic, they did not pay the $5 fine. They went to jail. And they went on hunger strikes, at which point they were force fed, which by the way is torture. They also had hoses used on them while they were protesting. But this nonviolent protest that they're going to utilize going to achieve the vote with the 19th Amendment. So, favorite non-Bill of Rights Amendment, guys? Thirteenth of slavery, fourteenth 
Rights of citizens and states are protected. Equal protection, due process of law. 15th all men can vote. 19th all men and women can vote. The NAACP is founded in 1907 for the purpose of advancing the rights of people of color. And they did so by lobbying states, lobbying Congress, but they didn't have a lot of success until the 1930s when they started the Legal Defense Fund. That's Thurgood Marshall right there between Ada Lowe and Samuel Fisher. And they started doing test cases. And a key test case happened here at the University of Oklahoma. The Board of Regents specifically said that no one could be admitted to the University of Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma Medical School, University of Oklahoma School of Law, unless they were white. And the president of the University of Oklahoma, just so you know, she graduated, she's from Chickasha, she graduated from Langston. Her brother had been recruited to do this, but he said, I'm going to Howard, I'm out. She said, I got it, I'll do it. And the president said, you're qualified. This is an excellent application. However, we cannot admit you to the University of Oklahoma because you're black. Why does the president of the University of Oklahoma write the letter like that? Exactly, and specifically, he then gives her something to sue about, right? If he just says, you're not qualified, right? If he just says, you're not qualified, then she can't sue. She sues, she's successful. She's admitted to the University School of Law. Thurgood Marshall is making this argument, which we'll get to in just a second, throughout all of these cases. But she's kept separated, and in this particular case, the Supreme Court says, specifically, the practice of law, the profession of law, requires that people know each other. Just last week, I had a meeting with a um, an attorney for the athletic department. And he and I went to law school together. So Jason and I sat down, we had a chat about what we needed to do. Right? Whenever I go to judges' chambers, the fact that I went to the University of Oklahoma School of Law means that we can talk about professors we had in common. Right? Or if I'm negotiating with somebody, I can talk about other things that make us able to be more likely to be what to each other? Civil, more likely to exchange things in a way. And so the Supreme Court says, because the practice of law requires this, and the University of Oklahoma is a flagship institution of the state of Oklahoma, you cannot deny on the basis of race admittance. She had a seat that she was allowed to sit in that was cordoned off in classes. There was a seat in the cafeteria where only she was allowed to sit, table, cordoned off. So there's some other cases that come out of this. Sweat versus Painter, University of Texas and the University of Oklahoma both have two cases that come out about admission to the university itself, undergraduate. And the Supreme Court basically says the same thing. It says, you know, in one of them it says, hey, it's a flagship institution of the state, the state of Oklahoma, the state of Texas. You have to allow admission for equality in terms of profession. Separate is not equal in this case. And then in one of the cases where you're allowed to be admitted, But your seat was out here. Yep. 
If you don't get to participate, the Supreme Court said no. Can't do that either. But they're still not quite by very good Marshall's argument. Not until Brown v. Board. In 1954, so we've gone from law schools to flagship institutions, higher ed, to elementary school. And they're finally saying, you know what, Thurgood Marshall? We get what you're saying. The intellectual, psychological, and financial damage that befalls black Americans precludes a finding of separate but equal doctrine. And they overturn Plessy versus Ferguson by saying separate is inherently unequal. Plessy versus Ferguson was what year? 1896. That's 58 years. That's 58 years. So immediately everything was better, right? 1955, the Supreme Court in Brown versus Two says, we weren't kidding. States, segregated systems must be dismantled with all deliberate speed, and President Eisenhower sends the National Guard in. This is where you should see a picture of me with Central High School in Little Rock. But I didn't put it in, I'm sorry. So we have the movement. Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks in Montgomery. Montgomery is a private bus system, okay? Private bus system. And the way that the buses were set up is that there would be a line, right? So there's here's the line, right? There's, it's a street that goes along. And there's just a card here that says colored, right? So white people this way, colored people in the back. So here's the line. Rosa Parks sits down. She works for the NC, NAACP, NC, I'm sorry. <laughs> now I have NCAA in my head, so she's not gonna go away. You know what I'm saying. So she and a friend and two other friends sit across the aisle because here's the line right here. It says colored right here. But the bus fills up. And when a white man gets on the bus, this row is told to get up or they'll be arrested. The three people with her get up. Think about, first of all, the bravery in staging this protest, the sit-in. You're going to be arrested. And then second of all, of doing it when you're left by yourself. Rosa Parks, when she talked about this, said, you know, people always said, oh, she was an old woman, she was tired, she didn't want to get up. She said, that was 38. I know you guys are young, so you're like, oh, that is old. It's not old. <laughs> she said, I was a young woman, but I was tired, I was tired. I was tired of being treated like a second-class citizen. I was tired of being dehumanized. I was tired of not being treated with respect. The Montgomery bus boycott is going to happen as a result. They get their second string guy in. The first guy that they wanted wasn't available. But he does okay. You may have heard of him. Martin Luther King Jr. He's going to lead the Montgomery bus boycott. And after a year, a year, the bus is in so much financial trouble that it voluntarily desegregates because they can't afford to continue. They can't make the money. Civil rights movement, known as the modern civil rights movement, is gonna organize boycotts, sit-ins, freedom rights, marches. 1963, we have the I Have a Dream speech with the March on Washington by Martin Luther King Jr. Now,
I've already talked about nonviolent protest. Henry David Thoreau's writings, right? Lucy Burns and Alice Falls. Mahatma Gandhi in India is going to use these ideas as well to stage nonviolent protests against the British occupation of India following World War II. And this is laid out in something you've already read, letter from Birmingham Jail, right? The four steps of nonviolent campaign. You're going to collect the facts. Is this actually discrimination? Is that what's going on here? And then you're going to point it out, hey, so did you know you were doing this? Can we work this out? If that doesn't happen, then self-purification. Why is this step important to Martin Luther King Jr. in particular? Why is it important? Guys? Say it. He was a pastor, right? But as part of nonviolence, if I go in angry and somebody hits me over the head, what am I going to do? I'm going to hit him back. Right? This is hard. This is hard. And then direct action that confronts the issue. The very first sit-in happens where, Eric? In Cat's Drugstore in Oklahoma City. Cat's Drugstore in Oklahoma City. Also, Martin Luther King Jr. applied to be a pastor in Oklahoma City, but was turned down. Yeah, he's always coming in second. He turns out okay. It turns out okay. Well, not well, well, no, no. Never mind. 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 <laughs> During this period of time, there continued to be violence against African Americans. We have the 16th Avenue Baptist Church in Birmingham. That's me, my kids. That's up there is how Birmingham became known as Bobbingham. These four girls died in a church while they were getting ready. Birmingham didn't even exist before the Civil War. It was built afterwards as an industrial city. In 1964, we have the passage of the Civil Rights Act. It's going to bar discrimination in public facilities, private businesses, employment, and education using two things, the Commerce Clause, the power of Congress under the Commerce Clause, and the power of the federal government under the 14th Amendment, equal protection. Two things. It's going to create the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. It's going to apply to race, color, religion, origin, and this was introduced on the floor of Congress in order to make people vote against it, but it passed anyway, sex. White Southerners are gonna argue that the act violates the Constitution. We're gonna see nullification acts in Southern states. We're gonna see Southern uh, Democrats turning to the Republican Party. But state imposed de jure, in, by law, de jure, by law, segregation is eliminated at once. That said, 10 years after Brown, less than 1% of African American students in the South attended integrated school. Less than 1%. Over time, these rulings and laws have opened up numerous occupations to minorities and women. In 1961, the President's Council on Women does a complete survey and they find pervasive discrimination against women. What pervasive means? It means in all aspects of life, whether it be in religion, in their homes, at work, in education. In every aspect of life, women are discriminated against. Pervasive discrimination. Betty Friedan writes a feminine mystique and says, hey, look, society is requiring women to identify themselves through their husbands, through their children. And so they're losing their identity. It's the reason why those little blue pills become so ubiquitous. Because women don't have identities of their own. In 1966, 
now sues saying the EOC has failed to enforce prohibition against gender discrimination. That question from the last slide. The result is the group that is most benefited from the Civil Rights Act are middle class white women. Middle class white women are sociologically or are socioeconomically better off in comparison to where they were then than any other group. Congress passed the ERA, but time is going to run out for the states to ratify. We've talked about American Indians, and I don't have time, and I'm so sorry to talk about more. But they're the last right to get the right to vote. And remember that unique status of being sovereign? That matters. Asian Americans also. And Eric, will you take roll? <coughs> Fastest growing minority group. But there's limited pan Asian identity. We did talk about this earlier. Professor Patterson, in particular, talked a lot about the internment of Japanese Americans. Uh, he also talked about the Chinese being banned from immigrating. But Latino Americans are the largest minority group in the United States today. Their activism and rallies began in the 1960s. It's going to be based off, again, the black civil rights movement. All of these are going to follow based upon the work done by that movement. Cesar Chavez is going to lead boycotts, United Farm Workers, voting, education, and immigration are major issues. 